Ciao W Teller, siamo all'ultima intervista. No, do I, I can look at you, I don't have to look at a camera, right? You have to look wherever you like. Ok, cool. Ok. Siamo all'ultima intervista e abbiamo lui. Ce l'abbiamo fatta con Danny Branson, presidente della giuria e soprattutto produttore per uh, Jimmy Always by My Side, grandissimo music supervisor e un sacco di cose. Thank you for being here with us. I just presented you to the people who will see this interview. I just said that you were here in Bologna to be like, you know, by the host of the festival, you know, you, you'll be like the, the presenter, you'll be the, the chief of the jury, and of course you're here to present your biggest production that is Jimmy, all is by my side. Wait, what? Thank you. Do they clean the streets every night? I was, we live next to here, we were running like... Expensive? No, How expensive not expensive is your not guys that. flat? It's like 300 euros single. A month? Ah, oh, that's good. Stavamo parlando di quanto costano gli affitti a Bologna. But, so, you're here to present your movie, a big production, Jimmy Always By My Side. Something completely different from the other music movies that we saw in our life, isn't it? Why that? Oh, I don't know if it's unlike anything you've ever seen but I'm very proud of it I mean uh, someone asked me once uh, what was it about and I said it's about 120 minutes long <laughs> uh, but uh, as you know it's called Jimmy All Is By My Side and it's um, of all the movies I've ever made it's, it's the most challenging and one of the most difficult tasks I've ever, ever undertaken in a movie. One, because I had to take, you know, I had a wonderful director, an amazing screenplay writer uh, named John Ridley, who just a couple months ago won the Academy Award for writing 12 Years a Slave. Uh, Academy Award is like, you know... The Oscar. The Oscar. What is the Oscar? I don't know. It's, uh, like it's a small little thing. Uh, a small little thing. They give yeah. you when you, like, draw beautiful, <laughs> you know, crayons mm. of, of uh, yeah, a firehouse or something. <laughs> but, but no, um, John is this, wrote an amazing screenplay. And after I made movies like Quasi Famoso <laughs> and uh, Ray and Vanilla Sky and, and movies that were very, very, very musical. Actually, every movie I've ever made, because that's the only reason they ever want me, <laughs> is uh, very music intensive films. Maybe uh, what's the difference between Ray and Jimmy? Because they speak quite the same thing about a giant of music. Ray was an, an, a really amazing personal project of a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker that I had seen since I was at film school named Taylor Hackford. And all I did on Ray was help Taylor get all of the music from of Ray Charles and of that period for his film. Uh, I merely was kind of his godfather, his musical Godfather to help him get the record companies, you know, give him the songs so that he could afford them. Because much like our movie, he had a very small budget too. But the biggest difference between Ray and Jimmy All Is By My Side is the fact, very big difference, actually. Uh, Ray was the classic, what we call biopic. Yeah. And a movie that was from the, the cradle, the beginning of one's life, as a biography, through the grave. What we call the cradle to grave. And what intrigued me about John's script was the fact that it was the opposite. It didn't tell the entire story of someone's life. Uh, in two hours because frankly that's impossible to make a satisfying movie even Ray mm -hmm. of someone's 60 or 70 year old life with in two hours and so when I read John's screenplay and I realized only then that it was about Jimi Hendrix oh 
Oh, my people. <laughs> Italian um, yeah. I love the Italianos. Um, <laughs> when I read John's screenplay, I thought, oh, my, my agent, Refu, who sent it to me, was smart enough not to tell me it was about Jimi Hendrix, or I wouldn't have even read it. I mean, my God, it's hard enough to make movies about, you know, actual people, mm -hmm. you know, living people, or their memoirs, but Jimi Hendrix? It's, it's impossible. The idea of, of, let alone finding an actor <laughs> that, that could dare have the courage, let alone the talent, convincingly play Jimi Hendrix. But when I read John's screenplay, not knowing what it was about, but my agent begged me to read it. I have this wonderful American agent. He's been my agent for over 25 years, and his name's Brian Laux. He's as much of an artist in the history of the agent's business. He's, he's very, very creative and someone I adore and one of my very, very best friends. And so he knows me well enough that he wouldn't dare tell me what the movie was, the script was about. So he gave you the script like saying, is it one of the best script I've ever heard? No, no, he, he just said, you must read it. Like in the old days in the record business where I started, what a promotion man would play you, would, would come in and pitch you or a manager on a new artist, he would pitch you and hype and hype and say, this is the greatest record you've ever heard. This band is so cool. You must listen to this. There was an old saying in the record business, just don't say it, play it, <laughs> you know? And, but with this, I was in, I was reading about the first 20 pages in and John's writing was so captivating that it pulled me in all the way. And more, most importantly, it revealed to me a side of Jimi Hendrix, his early career, that I was most interested in, that I always thought were some of the greatest stories never ever told in rock and roll. And very few people ever have been have written about or talked about or yeah uh, maybe it's sorry that, that like first what Brian Jones or Elvis Presley you can't describe him it's just difficult to describe yeah the so only the, the only thing they have to do with Jimi Hendrix is that they're dead guys but the not only indescribable and difficult to capture but the idea of this year where this guy from America who was unsuccessful. He was a tremendous guitar player, but rarely was he even the lead guitarist for the, the singers that he played behind, like Little Richard yeah, and yeah. this wonderful guy, um, Curtis Knight. Curtis Knight, yeah. And Curtis Knight. The ones you, you can see in the movie. Yeah, in yeah. the movie, he was the second guitarist in the band and played with Curtis, and Curtis not only paid him small wages, but he loaned him. The real trick was he loaned him his <laughs> guitar. So that was the only guitar Jimmy had at the time. And so when I read John's script, what took me in and what was different about it than any other musical you know, biography that I had written or, or someone had attempted, or excuse me, that I had read or that anyone had attempted to write, what pulled me in most was were the girls and their dialogue and this wonderful character that John wrote, this wonderful girl named Linda Keith and, and her story, the amazing story that I, I knew a little bit about but I, didn't, I wasn't entirely familiar with in which, you know, uh, as the movie represents that she was a big fan of rock and roll and I believe and friends uh, with Keith Richards and and she had gone into a club she had flown to New York from London where she lived and uh, she had gone into a club in New York and saw Curtis Knight but she wasn't interested in Curtis Knight she but she was captivated by this guitar player in the second row named Jimmy James and she ended up taking him home and they ended up you know hanging out and she turned him on to all of her records 
And the fact that John wrote this amazing girl, this amazing character. I believe that, that's the best character. That, the oh, it's one of the great characters the I've ever really read in cinema and rock and roll that she was Jimmy's muse. She turned him on to amazing blues artists and her blues collection of blues records, but also Bob Dylan. Yeah. So without destroying the movie that I hope, you know, your, your audience sees, I, I, I was so taken and so charmed by her and by the story of that first night of them meeting each other that I was fascinated. And I was fascinated with what screenwriter, who could have written this amazing script about about rock and roll and about and the dialogue that I so believed and that was so credible and real to me. And someone that, had, John had never been on the road in rock and roll, touring with a band. He'd never been backstage at a concert. He was merely a great, you know, fan of music. And he tells this wonderful story that uh, he had a weekend show on National Public Radio in America. By John Ridley, you say? John Ridley. Oh. Yeah, old movies and your old things. Between all the movies you've done in your life, who's your favorite work? For me, it's Vanilla Sky. Just Thank because, you. Just because one thing. You choose. I'm very, I love Vanilla Sky. Your choices of music, you know, Super you. Rose and Radiohead. It's really. Sigur Rose and Tom York and Radiohead and Johnny's Green guitar Radiohead. playing. And uh, Johnny's Paul McCartney. Yeah. Paul McCartney's yeah. amazing uh, original song that he wrote for us. Yeah, yeah I you know. know. Vinyl Sky is not only a, what I find just those are my favorite movies. The movies I make with my dear dear friend and my favorite director and writer Cameron Crowe. We've known each other since I think 1975, 1976, and, and we were always the very very youngest guys in the room. <laughs> When we met, um, we met at a rehearsal for a girl, a girl named Emmy Lou Harris, who was just beginning her career, and she was discovered by a guy, you know, a legendary guy in rock named Graham Parsons, who was in the Birds and yeah. the Flying Burrito Brothers, and amazing guy, and obviously a, a close dear friend of Keith Richards, and so I had gone out to see her to rehearse. And I was considering, I ran a theater in Los Angeles, a 5,000 seat rock theater called the Universal Amphitheater. And I was always looking for new artists that I could introduce with my headlining, you know, superstar bands. And so I, I was fascinated with her. She sang like country and folk and rock, but yet she was all of them, but nothing, none of them. She came from Boston, and she was always, you know, just so fascinating to me. And so I, I was lucky enough to book her and have her open, you know, at my theater. And so when I went out there, there was a long-haired guy with a microphone much mm -hmm. like yours. Okay. He was working for Rolling Stone magazine, and he was doing an interview for her. And I ended up driving him home. And we were the youngest guys, as mm -hmm. I said, there. And we've been best friends ever since. And so we've worked on his very first movie together, Fast Times in Richmond High. To we made singles. I Excuse love. Me. We made Say Anything, where I had Peter Gabe Gabriel's In Your Eyes with John Cusack holding a boombox. Like, <laughs> here we are in, in Italy, but... I always said it was like Romeo and Juliet, yeah. but instead of serenading her, he held this boombox <laughs> up to her, playing a song, like kind of almost serenading her. And we put in the song In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel, and it's, it's, I'm very, very proud of it, and it became a very appreciated part of cinema, music, and um, so... We did that, and then we made a movie in, I think it was 90, 1992, we made a movie Singles. called Singles. 1992, yeah. And it was before there was anything ever 
called grunge. Yeah. And we were, we Cameron, must, was, thank Cameron you. was going, thank you. <laughs> we must thank you for the grunge. <laughs> thank you. But Cameron was, Cameron was living on and off in Seattle. Um, he was going out with a wonderful girl that later became his wife. And she lived up there. And so he would call me and tell me about this amazing scene that was happening in Seattle. But they didn't have bars that served alcohol. They had bars that served coffee. And I thought, oh, you're crazy. And I went up there, and there was this amazing scene and, and bands that were every, in every club and they were, it was so wonderful. It was like the old days of the Sunset Strip in Los Angeles. And these guys wore short, <laughs> cut-off jeans or shorts like yours. And they'd wear big army combat boots. And they, all of what, and they had facial hair like goatees and Van Goghs and, and mustaches. And they all kind of looked like the Beatles on the cover of Sgt. Pepper. Yeah, yeah. They had long hair, and, but yet they were the exact opposite of all the crap that was on MTV. Yeah. And all the bands out of England, like, they were the absolute opposite of Duran Duran. Guns and Roses. Yeah, all that. Their honesty and their purity and their love for bait rock. And, and so when people would call me from Los Angeles and they would ask me, Danny, what's the scene? What's going on up there? Why are you guys making this movie up there? And I said, you know, how could I describe the music? I thought it was, their songs kind of like were a cross between acoustic Neil Young, who I love, my favorite artist, combined with like heavy metal. Yeah. Like, um, uh, they they always said like they, they you know, yeah they said their influences were Black Sabbath yeah and Black this. Sabbath these were my favorite bands but their influence were were yeah, heavy okay. heavy rock but the idea that they married the acoustic and 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 amazing you know li with wonderful lyrics you know artists that I so loved combined with hard rock and roll. I, love, I, I thought it was him. this beautiful Alice marriage and this combination that They're was amazing. That. And so we were so lucky. You know, um, all I did was try not to fuck it up. <laughs> and uh, and so I, I we... I to say a thing in Italian. Ci rendiamo conto questo, questo, questo signore in questo film, singles. Signore! This man, Signorita. Signorita. <laughs> Questo uomo nel film singles ha la colonna sonora, lui si è scoperto per Gemmi, Madonna, Soundgarden, gli Alice in Chains. Insomma, grazie. Did you say Madonna? No, no, no. Okay. Mad Honey. Mad Honey. Mad Honey. Mad Honey. Yeah, yeah, Mark Arms. Amazing, mm. amazing artist. But his band Mad Honey. But we used, we used, um, you know, so many of these guys worked in our art department. And they were on bicycle messages. Oh, and they had like five jobs, one of them being on our movie. And they would always, like you, slip me their CD, <laughs> slip me at the time cassettes, if any of you remember what cassettes, cassettes were. Right? But they would slip me their demos. Uh, but I was so impressed with the passion that they had for music, they didn't want to be rock and roll stars. They didn't want to be on MTV. They didn't want to be on a boat singing yeah. Rio. They didn't want supermodels, you know, around them. They loved music. And so that made me love them. And it was very, very easy, you know. And But yet, more importantly, their music spoke to me. And their music was so full of passion. But the, the, the point of view of, of, of their generation, and I, you know, those bands, all these kids, all these guys, oh, so long uh, turned out to be Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden. Uh, the only band, the only artist I used outside of Seattle was a band that Chris Cornell of Soundgarden turned me on to. 
He phoned me up. He was on tour with Soundgarden. They were the first of the bands to get a big record deal with A&M Records. And they got a big record deal. And he phoned me up from Chicago and he said, Danny, I kept walking down the street. It was during the time of in America we have Halloween. Yeah. Which is an excuse for one night a year. Everyone to put on a mask. Yeah, we know we have it here also. And, uh, well, you guys probably have it every Friday night, <laughs> literally. But uh, he was walking down the street, and he saw all these flyers, all these posters, all the kiosks. And they were, you know, promoting their own concerts, club shows. And they were called Smashing Pumpkins. But Chris was walking down the street in Chicago on tour and he saw this these posters and he was fascinated who you know he didn't know if it was a halloween yeah. show or if it was a rock band and so he being, pumpkins. Yeah. <laughs> he being a wonderful artist wonderful artist and uh, uh a really great guy he phoned me and he goes you know he walked into a record store and he's combing through the records you know These are the guys why I love them. They're like me, the, no matter where they are. You guys missed it. You missed even having the luxury of walking into a store that just sells records. What we call record stores. Now, because of the internet in the digital age, there's no record stores. There's no such thing as records. You know, everyone just downloads them or they get turned on by a friend. But during our era, you know, um, we could walk into a store dedicated to music and only music. And he was going through the record store, as he told me, and he sees the same, this, this record by a group called the Smashing Pumpkins. And here it was. He put it <laughs> together with the advertisements and he bought the record and he listened to it. And he calls me up and he goes, man, I just bought this record. He told me the whole story. And he goes, I put it on. And he goes, you got to hear this. And it was just a, you know, self-financed, you know, home demo that Billy and the band made. And, uh, and uh, I listened to it and I loved it. He was right. And he turned me on to the Smashing Pumpkins. And I, I got the phone number and I called Billy Corgan you know, and uh, out of the blue. And I told him I was making a movie with my best friend, Cameron, Cameron Crow. Crow. And I said, you know, we, would you consider writing a brand new song <laughs> for me? And so, uh, you know, he asked me, you know, he said, you know, what do you want me to write about? What's the scene? And I go, no, 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 no. I never tell an artist, uh, what to write about or I never tell them a specific scene because more often than not they become very self-conscious and they write in literally what that scene is or what it's about and so I just say just send me the best song you've ever written and and I'll figure out what to do with it and so two weeks later He sent me a demo of a brand new song that he and the band recorded called Drow. And not only was it amazing, but, and, you know, not from Seattle, and yet it, it fit completely with all of those bands and all of their sound yeah, yeah, and sad. all their passion and their heart, which most appeals to me, that I not only put it on the record, but it became the biggest, their biggest song ever on American FM yeah. radio. So it's really wonderful. And so in addition to those bands, ironically, I put Jimi Hendrix on the, <laughs> on the album. Yeah, because it's Because in America, frankly, Jimi Hendrix is never associated with Seattle. But he lived, he, he grew up there. Oh, he's born there. He's I believe born there. he was born there. Yeah, because we're but, talking about but that. But I think he got out of there as quick as he could. You know, it became a paratrooper in the army. But 
I don't know the exact story of Jimi Hendrix's why, why he left Seattle, but in America, we don't associate Jimi Hendrix with a city. You just associated uh, with music. I always associated Jimi Hendrix more with London yeah. than I did with anywhere in America. That's why when I read John's screenplay and it being set in this kind of undiscovered year of Jimi Hendrix's life and career where Linda Keith and his first manager Chaz Chandler, the amazing bass yeah, player for the animals. animals he was looking for a new career after the band broke up, the animals and Eric Burden went off to be a solo artist and, and found another group called War and you know did all those amazing hit records and Chaz became a rock manager and his first artist was Jimmy and so John's story not only captured that but captured the kind of the unsung heroes the heroines of rock and roll and those are so often time the women the girls that so inspired the artists and in this case, Linda Keith had such belief in absolute immediate recognition of Jimmy, at the time, Jimmy James's, you know, talent, that she introduced him to Chaz Chandler, and Chaz, you know, got him to come over to England, and, you know, there Jimmy found his voice, found so his sound, if you will, yeah. <laughs> and developed his style. And so that's why the association with Seattle merely, to me, just stops there, other than the fact of his birth certificate. Wow. And so, but much like, but I wanted to, and Cameron, very much, we wanted to, we just wanted to give a tip of the hat to Jimi Hendrix. And so in a way, we turned on Jimi Hendrix to this brand new generation yeah. that only only when our picture was released did Time magazine and all the yeah. all the you know magazines wrote these stories and oh I, I, I at last not with Nirvana you know yeah, I don't know who named it grunge, grunge but, but we had never ever you know living up there I never heard the term grunge. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know who came up with that term, but, uh, but it, um, it stuck, uh, whether properly or, or not. And uh, to me, it was just great music. It was great rock and roll. And in the era of commercialism and where, where looks, you know, uh, uh, took over the, you know, the, the rock scene then with MTV where the video and what you look like and what your hair was like and what your clothes looked like and where your video was mm -hmm. shot was more important than the song. songs. So it was such a, a bad period of music and out of, of all places, the northwest of America right. that was never known for great music. Um, suddenly comes this amazing collection of artists that I had known as like you, just <laughs> as as people I met on the movie and and when they turned out to be talented, let alone discovered by the world. Imagine, you know, my wonderful, wonderful surprise <laughs> and that finally success and creative success came to the good guys. <laughs> and the guys that were talented in music that I loved and that I grew up on. And so, well, yeah, it was very, very wonderful. And then we, but the movie was kind of a, again, like Say Anything. It, it got wonderful reviews, amazing reviews. But it, you know, it did okay at the box office. And uh, uh, well, we but then we made our movie Jerry Maguire. Yeah, I know. And that was our big, huge breakthrough hit in America and in Italy, <laughs> all, all around the world. Well, I have to thank you. We 
we I want to talk for a long going. time. Well, we can't. We can't because right. we're running out of time of the cameras. And it's not, it's, right, it's, and it's raining. Okay, sure, no problem. And it's you raining. We can go on without camera. We, we can go on without camera, baby. Just know, so, well, I was willing to do more. Just ciao, know. ciao. <laughs> just say bye to the hotelers and we just start talking normally. You want uh, to say goodbye to the Italians and yeah, say ciao? Yeah. You know how lame it sounds to American, for an American, to what, a, what a lame American, how, I, how stupid I sound saying ciao. Tell it's funny, like it's funny. Doing an imitation. Tell me, tell me, in one word. In one, one word, word me? What's, what's culture? You, in one word. Culture? Culture, for you. Culture is the air we breathe. <laughs> culture is the ground we walk on. Culture is the music we listen to, the art hanging on the wall, the, heart, the art that a graffiti artist uh, with no professional talent, you know, scribbles on the side of a garbage can. Culture is an amazing club. Culture is amazing people dancing. Culture is amazing chefs cooking food. Culture is McDonald's. <laughs> it's not good, that it was one word. <laughs> <laughs> say that, say that to me. You're an Italian, man. You know that life can't be described in one word, let alone culture. But culture is life, and life as we live it. And uh, those that document it properly are lucky enough, or, you know, talented enough to actually capture it properly. So, you know. Art, art, you know, is one man's picture, rich man's picture on a wall, or it can be a great fucking song <laughs> played by, you know, a guy with a guitar on, on, the, on the street. street. So it's very, it's impossible to describe in one word. You're the only one who said that finally it's impossible. Culture, what's culture? I can't say that in one word. No. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for everything. Appreciate it. I really love it. And send it. me your music. I, I, I will do. I will cool. do. But wait, now we cut off. Bye bye.